Welcome to the first day of the St. Louis Regional Freightways Virtual Freight Week STL 2022. I'm Mary Lamy, the Executive Vice President of Multimodal Enterprises for Bi-State Development, which includes the St. Louis Regional Freightway as one of its enterprises. Freight Week STL is being held in partnership with the Inland Marine Expo hosted in downtown St. Louis. We're kicking off Freight Week STL with Innovation Day, during which we're featuring some of the emerging technologies that have the potential to dramatically change the movement of freight in the years to come. In our opening session, we'll focus on the advances being made by the St. Louis startup Intramotive Autonomous Rail and the development of an autonomous zero emissions rail car that would be able to operate without the use of a locomotive. Autonomous rail cars would enable better use of the U.S. freight rail network and help mitigate the type of supply chain challenges occurring around the globe while reducing pollution in the rail industry. So before we get dived in, we're going to start with thanking our sponsors. This year's presenting sponsors include Burns McDonald, Castle Contracting, Amron, Illinois, the Jerry Costello Group, and Crawford, Murphy & Tilly. Our supporting sponsors are the Boeing Center, Design 9, and the Hauser Group. Associate sponsors for this year include the Southern Illinois Builders Association, Southern Illinois Construction Advancement Program, Terracon, and CDI. Our panelist today is Timothy Lucini, PhD and CEO of Intramotive Autonomous Rail. Welcome, Tim, and let's start with a quick introduction of your background and your organization. Thanks, Mary, and thanks for letting me be a part of this uh, panel today. I'm excited to uh, share what we're building at Intramotive. But uh, again, my name is Tim Lucchini, and I'm currently the CEO of Intramotive and one of the co-founders here, and we're based in the St. Louis area. Um, Alex and I started this business in 2020, um, and at the time, he was doing his MBA at USC and doing case studies right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, in supply chain and specifically starting to look at the freight industry. Um, and uh, at that point, we were right on the edge of what was to become a massive uh, logistics challenge that uh, was really unexpected as far as a collection of black swan events coming together. But uh, I come to this from aerospace. Um, prior to uh, starting Intramotive, I was uh, a managing uh, or engineering manager at Boeing. In St. Louis here, where I had anywhere from 15 to 40 engineers, um, and at the, the time before departing, one of the teams I was managing was working on building flying cars, package delivery drones for the urban air mobility sector. Um, and uh, really, Alex and I came together uh, and kind of meshed the ideas of what he was looking at in the supply chain side of things and what I was working on from the technology side of things to try to bring something new to rail. And that's really where we've come together with this battery electric rail car that uh, we'll be excited to tell you a little bit more about. And then in general, I have a background in, in engineering. I um, also serve here in the St. Louis area as an adjunct uh, faculty member at the College of Engineering with uh, the joint program between Washington University and, and UMSL. Um, and then uh, Alex and I have been connected to this problem since we were kids because we Grew up in a small railroad town and uh, we're excited to be building the technology that uh, we think will help make railroads competitive for the, the next 200 years, not just the, the last 200 years. Alrighty, well, that's excellent. Okay, Tim, so Intermotive may be a startup, but you clearly have an impressive background and extensive technical expertise that's guiding the work your company is doing to develop the new autonomous rail cars. What are some of the trends that you're seeing related to the movement of freight by rail and truck that you hope to reverse with these new vehicles? What we see as far as the trend goes is the world's continuing to push towards just-in-time delivery of just what you need when you need it to be there. And you're seeing it with everything, whether that's two to three day shipping of consumer goods bought online, uh, pushing the limits towards one day shipping. Um, but the, also the reality is that we're seeing that with more than just consumer pandemic products that we see on the store shelves, but also uh, industrial customers are feeling this type of pain as well. And it doesn't matter if you're an auto manufacturer or if you're in the supply chain somewhere, or if you're even at the raw material side working as a mine in, in uh, the Western states, you're all feeling this type of, of pain. Uh, and when we would look at the transportation solutions and we don't look at aerospace and, and uh, uh, marine for a second, we just focus on truck and, and rail. What we see is generally year over year increases in, in trucking volumes and and flat or slightly decreasing volumes in rail. 
with projections for that to increase as you look at new technologies coming on the market and a shift away from fossil fuel based energy sources. So you see um, that uh, uh, the energy economy is changing. The willingness for customers to pay for that speed and flexibility that the trucking options provide uh, is there. And in general, you're forced with this dichotomy between trucking and rail, uh, where rail is your low cost solution and trucking is what offers speed and flexibility. And uh, that's a lot of tension in most supply chains. Um, and uh, we think that what's needed is, is something new that builds on all these industry trends that you see with autonomous trucking on the forefront, electrification of trucking in conversation everywhere. Um, but uh, rail has an opportunity here, I think, to build something that is more competitive than those solutions uh, and builds on top of the strengths of the rail infrastructure that runs across this country. And we think that the opportunities there to build tools um, to help the second part, which is that generally people who are using rail and trucking prefer trucking. Uh, they prefer the flexibility, they prefer the service, uh, and they prefer that reliability element that uh, is out there. And if an autonomous truck comes along that can cut costs further, um, that's just gonna continue to push uh, demand and, and volumes towards trucking. And I think where we're at today, we can see that as either a threat or an opportunity. And uh, I think the opportunity in this is to couple better service and better reliability with the existing advantages of rail. And that is that cost advantage. That is that national uh, 160,000 plus miles of rail that are there. And then um, having these efficiencies in rail built on top of um, uh, a new mode of better customer service through better technology. We agree. We think this is a great opportunity and we're excited, you know, that you're located here in the St. Louis region. Okay, so you are currently developing a commercial demonstration unit for um, the vehicle that's called Tugvolt. Tell us a little bit more about the vehicle itself and its advanced battery formulation when you and when do you expect it to begin the, the staging of for a, a test of this rail car? Yeah, so what we're building, we're calling it the commercial demonstration unit of a Tugvolt, but effectively it's a battery electric self-propelled rail car where the concept being, uh, especially early, you can have this vehicle in first and last mile service and, and create a form factor that can be as fast and flexible as a truck. And then in those middle mile operations where class ones are very efficient today and have very long efficient trains, it's still got all the required safety systems to service as a rail car during those legs of the journey. And so what you've got there is something that can complement that current model of rail transportation and build on top of it. Uh, but still allow for the packetization of that freight and those vehicles and allow the customers of the rail uh, system to get what they need from that uh, speed and reliability of transportation. And wherever possible, um, you can also just solve the latency issues. Uh, so the, the time that's required for vehicles to sit around waiting to be moved with a, a vehicle like this. From a technology perspective, what it really encompasses is three uh, containerized modules, one which is our sensory location and perception stack, telling us what the vehicle's location is, where it is, how fast it's going, what's going on around the vehicle. Then you've got your, your fuel tank, or you've got a large collection of, of batteries on board the vehicle. And then you've got your propulsion drivetrain, uh, which is effectively electric drivetrain uh, with regenerative braking um, and uh, an additional uh, braking system on top of it. And then we've got some early pilots here in private and captive use cases uh, that are scheduled towards the end of the year, uh, where we're pretty focused on things like aggregate halls, um, and we're advancing this commercial demonstration unit towards uh, those goals uh, and those opportunities in these private and captive use cases. When we look at rail uh, and trucking in an effort to electrify, um, you can see things like the uh, incumbent technologies for uh, WabTech and Progress Rail building battery electric locomotives. And then you can see electrification efforts in, in trucking. Um, uh, and it's really just important to set the perspective for what battery technology is capable of today and, and what it can do for us today. Um, and really that is understanding the incumbent, which is the petroleum fuels that all these vehicles are running on already. Um, and ultimately, if you take a diesel fuel uh, or a, a petroleum-based fuel. Generally, you're looking at something that's got 50 
40 to 50 times more energy density uh, than our best battery technology today. And, and what that means is you've got lithium chemistries that can be around 200 watt hours per kilogram for their energy density, where fossil fuels are, are 12,000 watt hours per kilogram. Um, and what that requires then is understanding that um, you working with challenges around range capabilities and total payloads. What it means for trucking is if you want to replace a, a ton or 2,000 pounds of diesel fuel, you're going to be looking at um, anywhere from 20 to 30,000 pounds of batteries to replace that. And your burden load uh, can only be 80,000 pounds for a vehicle like that. So you're starting to eat into what the payload can be. And in the rail model with what we're doing on the tug bolt, we can have these battery packs quite a bit smaller, more in the order, order of magnitude of what an electric car might be because of the efficiencies of rail rolling resistances, aerodynamic drag benefits, and, and things like that. And then shrink those pack sizes down, uh, stacking those efficiencies on top of each other to give us vehicles that can have 100 to 600 miles of range with 100 ton types of payloads uh, and not sacrificing those burden payloads because the, the rail capacity can handle so much more load. Uh, and really that gives us an opportunity to right size the, the energy storage to the, the mission. And then we can also use energy storage technologies, battery technologies that are available off the shelf today. Uh, whereas certain other solutions and other mobility sectors still need uh, two or four X improvements in energy storage to close some of the business cases that they're looking at. Um, and uh, Ultimately, again, with the benefits of rail, allowing for things like vehicle platooning kind of inherently allowing for vehicles to be built to handle loads and sharing loads between the, the vehicles and the consist. That, again, gives some opportunities for energy sharing um, and a more efficient utilization of those battery packs when you start to distribute those packs along multiple vehicles, multiple propulsion systems uh, along the length of a train. And ultimately, again, this helps us reduce the individual vehicle costs uh, while still carrying the right types of volumes for uh, those long ranges. I mean, it sounds like you've knocked out of the park when it comes to the environmental impact. Where do you see the new tugboat, tugboat being deployed in the near term? In the near term, um, we see that we're looking at these private captive use cases, um, scenarios where you have a a river port and a transload facility that are then connected to a, a processing facility that might be a, a few miles or tens of miles inland. Um, and then you can have this doing those ferrying operations and you can reduce the total size of a, a vehicle fleet that would be required if it is rail today, or you can offer this competitive continuous motion of material um, if you're competing against a trucking scenario where they wanna have more uh, that is continuously being ferried. Um, but uh, ultimately, looking at these as uh, scenarios for dedicated routes and dedicated equipment, um, while we look at uh, how we go through the regulatory environment and, and work into some of these larger markets where we start to interact with the interchange um, and uh, uh, enable uh, the operation of this in those consists uh, along longer routes. So are you thinking we could see something in like the next five years, something sooner? The pilot use cases that we're pushing towards are scheduled toward the uh, end of the year here. And then as you look at the adoption curve for the technology from those use cases into the larger market, um, uh, really we're looking at uh, that probably taking a, a longer period of time um, as you work through the regulatory environment for where we're approaching this as certifying as a rail car that's been modified with additional equipment. Um, ultimately, this can fall into a new class of vehicles that's not quite a, a locomotive engine and it's not quite a rail car. Uh, so there's some work for us to do on uh, that side of things. But in the interim, uh, there's a lot of interplant railroads, uh, things like steel mills, uh, uh, facilities and casting operations where they have rail, rails moving around their facilities, uh, and uh, even connecting point to points inside the same factory uh, where this could be a really useful, viable technology to uh, go out there, collect all the data that's shown it's operating safely and reliably, and then uh, use that as a package as we go to the larger rail networks. And when you do that, that test pilot program um, and in the next year, would you do that here in the St. Louis region? We have one opportunity along the um, Ohio River. And then um, we are actively looking 
in this region as well for opportunities um, and have had some discussions with various bodies um, in the region that uh, offer us a couple of things, whether it's uh, just a pure section of track that's good for testing or whether it's a, a revenue generating uh, movement of material that's uh, in a value add and, and we'll continue to have those conversations and would welcome uh, any others that would might come from uh, this event or, or later when opportunities emerge. All right, we've been hearing a lot over the past couple of years regarding congestion at major ports in the U.S. What role do you see the tug vault in helping to address that particular supply chain issue and helping keep freight flowing? Absolutely. Um, the congestion in the ports during the pandemic has uh, definitely been an extremely interesting thing to watch occur. Um, and this confluence of unexpected events uh, really has pointed out some fragile elements of our total logistics system. Um, but in a traditional scenario where material needs to be moved, generally the first response is to try to throw more equipment at the problem um, because of uh, that bottleneck. And in a lot of cases, the result of that is that this serves to magnify the problem that was there in the first place because you're making a, you've got a traffic jam in the city and you're adding more vehicles to that traffic jam and that just serves to congest the area even more. Um, we think that the solution to those types of problems isn't necessarily more rail cars or more trucks or more shipping containers showing up there, but it's that you can better utilize the vehicles that you've already got by keeping those vehicles and that material in motion, increasing the utilization factor of both, um, and uh, ultimately shortening the, the size of the trains, shortening the number of cars in a consist and reducing the congestion in that way so that you can then allow for things to get moving again. Um, and uh, in a port scenario or whether it's a ocean port or a river port, um, one thing that we think is important there is just getting that material moved away from that point of congestion and in inland uh, as quickly as possible uh, and in an increasingly efficient manner and then adding robustness, robustness to the supply chain um, and logistics system in that way. Um, and you can do it by keeping the vehicles in motion again without having to build massive amounts of new infrastructure, new lanes on highways or new sections of rail, uh, which again is a common first step to look at when you look at this congestion. Uh, and that's when you look at it framed with, this is the state of the art for technology today. Whereas I think what we're bringing to the table here is something new that can help us unlock hidden capacity in the existing uh, rail networks and, and logistics and supply chains um, as they exist today without massive investments in the infrastructure from that side of things. So this is exciting. So is there anything else we haven't touched on our viewers today should know or any final comments? Yeah, I think uh, just a couple more comments, especially when we're looking at very serious ESG goals um, that are important for us to be hitting. And, and the first part is any uh, movement of uh, trucking volume to rail is a immediately environmentally beneficial. I think uh, trucking in general is gonna emit nine times more greenhouse gases uh, per ton mile of transportation than rail is. So moving things to rail is a, a really strong story because trucking alone accounts for anywhere from 23 to 29% of the, the total greenhouse gas emissions in the uh, United States. And that's the largest single contributor. Um, in order for rail to really be able to do that and to take some of that market share and volume, they have to be offering something that's competitive with what trucking is offering. And I think, again, tug bolts uh, in a form factor that can be uh, similar to what Dan customers are gonna wanna consume and still take advantages of the efficiencies of rail are the right type of path to head down. And ultimately you get all these other ancillary benefits of getting trucks off the road, reducing congestion, improving traffic safety that come with the adoption of a vehicle like this. And then on top of it, just want to say thank you again for letting us share what we're building, uh, giving us the opportunity to um, talk about Intramotive for a few minutes. And uh, we're excited to build the next generation of rail vehicles here that uh, are posed to help keep rail uh, competitive for the next several hundred years. Thank you, Tim. The U.S. freight rail network spans roughly 140,000 miles, according to the Federal Railroad Administration. It's clear from today's discussion that Tim and his colleagues at Intermotive see tremendous opportunity to use their new autonomous rail cars to expedite the supply chain process in the short term 
and ultimately to unlock the full potential of the U.S. rail system to take better advantage of its massive reach. We wish you continued success and thank you for joining us today to provide this excellent overview. I'd also like to give a final thank you to our sponsors for Freight Week STL 2022. Their support makes it possible for us to continue to deliver the great content that is a hallmark of this annual conference. Freight Week continues today with our 11 a.m. session providing an update on the innovative container and vessel services coming to the St. Louis region. And we'll be back tomorrow at 9 a.m. to spotlight the St. Louis region's role in one of the world's most comprehensive port networks. We hope you can join us and encourage you to share links of any of our Freight Week content with others who may be interested.